Mr. and myself have uh, written and published at the beginning of this year, the end of last year, beginning of this year with Pluto. And um, it's an ambitious title. Uh, the subtitle is Through the Prism of Value. So what we are trying to do in the book is try to explain some of the main contradictions, developments in capitalism in the 21st century, but looking at it from Marx's law of value. And we think that that provides the most, the best guide to thread our way through all the developments taking place in capitalism, the modern ones in the in the 21st century. Um, and so uh, this book uh, really is built around basically about uh, six chapters, uh, which cover what we think are the key themes in that uh, in the in the century that we've now entered into the third decade. Uh, to help me, I'm going to, as long as the host can allow, I want to show you some uh, slides to take you through the main points in the book. Um, so if I can just uh, share a screen here with you. Not at the moment, I can't. Some, if somebody could enable me to share a screen, I can. You should be able to now. Okay. Uh, so let me see if I can get the right one. Um, yeah, here we are. Okay. Right. So um, that's the title of the book. Um, that's where it's available. A quick plug to begin with, and you can see the cover there uh, as an indicator. Those who I'm sure all of you have bought the book by now, but nevertheless, um, I shall take you through it if I can. And basically, we've got the themes of the book are as follows. And out of the themes of the book, I think we have the basis for quite a good discussion about the big challenges that capitalism is taking on and the contradictions that have developed in the last uh, three decades. Uh, first chapter is about nature. We started with nature because it's a, literally a burning issue. And of how that we've seen the tremendous development of commodification of nature, turning uh, natural resources all the species uh, of the world, commodifying them into something that can be used by capital to increase profit. So, and that has led, as we know, to serious uh, developments with the very existence of the planet in the environment, both around pandemics and about the destruction of uh, species and climate change. In the second chapter, we go and have a look at uh, uh, modern developments in money because obviously we've moved from the 19th century where at least international money was, and most money was dominated or represented in terms of a commodity like gold or silver, and then in paper currencies throughout the 20th century, but increasingly towards the end of last century and to this century, it's become a digital currency primarily. And that has uh, meant, how do we relate that uh, development of digital currencies in, in relation to the theory of value or the Marxist law of value, which we explained in the first chapter. I'll go to that in a minute. And uh, then we looked at some of the uh, modern theories, called, for example, the modern monetary theory, and uh, obviously the big uh, issue, the topical issue of the last two or three years, which is the emergence again of inflation, uh, where it appears that uh, money supplies faster than the goods that services that capitalism is producing with, with by ex the exploitation of labor. Then in the third chapter, we look at crises. Uh, again, again, over the theory of crises uh, from a point of view of Marxist law of value, looking at value and surplus value production, how that leads through profitability and the changes in profitability into regular and recurring crises. In the fourth chapter, we developed that internationally to look at the question of imperialism again, a subject that uh, really in the, um, throughout most of the 20th century seemed to lose uh, interest, at least amongst those uh, both activists and academics, even from the left point of view. But of course, in the 21st century has now become a big issue. The huge flows of value both in terms of capital through um, transfer of values from trade. Has... Sorry, sorry, Michael, your audio keeps changing. I don't know That's if you really mind. Yeah, let me see if I can do something about that. If I speak a bit closer, does that help at all? 
That's okay, but then sometimes you move, seem to move away, so do yeah. you um, quite I think that uh, as I didn't quite set up the mic for the this particular computer, um, how's it sound at the moment? Let me see. This is fine. If you stay yeah. when you started, it was fine. Then we yeah. deteriorated. In I will catch a keep still and see if uh, that follows. If interrupt me again yes. if you, if it goes wrong. Uh, so in the fourth chapter we have uh, imperialism. I've, I've described and we deal with the question of. The, the economic foundations of imperialism in the 21st century and what that means for the growing conflicts that we're seeing now between the imperialist bloc led by the US and those who do not part of that imperialist bloc, in particular, Russia, China, and others. And in the fifth chapter, quite a difficult one, we look at uh, the relationship of the development of robots, what that means for uh, people's jobs, over the uh, next few decades, but more than that, to try and analyze the nature of the new forms of labor uh, creation of value through mental labor as opposed to just physical labor. And we point out in our view that mental labor is still a material thing, not some mystical thing inside of our heads. It actually is a, uh, helps to develop and improve and let, raise the level of value available to capital and that knowledge is increasingly being commodified in such a way that capital can appropriate the uh, labor created from mental activity and knowledge. And of course, the final chapter is socialism itself and looking at the relationship of whether there's value under socialism uh, as we have it under capitalism, to, is value created in terms of uh, uh, the way it is in capitalism or does it disappear? Does the market continue under socialism? Is there a state? And how do we, how's that process of transition from say the end of the capitalist state when workers gain control uh, of, an, of the economy and the state towards a full uh, socialist society? Um, but just let's remind ourselves what when we talk about um, capitalism seen through the prism of value, what do we mean? Well, Marx's law of value as opposed to other uh, value theories it makes the point that all value comes from labor and nowhere else. So as Marx said, uh, any child would know that everybody, if everybody ceases to work, uh, then nothing is produced. And so it's uh, machines don't work, cannot produce without human labor, at least so far. And that uh, that is the basis of how anything is produced, things that we need, uh, material things, services that would require, require human labor, but also from the point of view of capitalism, they cannot get value or surplus value and profit out of any other way except by the use of human labor and human labor power. That's the fundamental point to be made about the nature of value, but it has a dual characteristic. Yes, uh, there is value in everything that we produce in terms of the need that we, we need it, we use it, but also from the point of view of capital, there's an exchange value. There's something that can be sold on the market at a price and therefore receiving a profit, which the capitalists can uh, appropriate. So the value has two aspects to it, the value of a commodity, both its use and its exchange value. And that con there is a contradiction that develops under capitalism between what capitalists require from the point of view of gaining more profit and for what a society as a whole requires from their needs in uh, in making a life that is reasonable and uh, prosperous. So there is, as Marx uh, pointed out, a key factor here, the two kinds of value, use value and exchange value. And while surplus labor is created in every form of mode of production, whether it's a slave economy or a feudal society, it's the surplus labor that is appropriated by capitalists is done in a hidden way. Workers apparently get a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, but actually they produce more value in labor hours than they get paid for. And the additional uh, hours which are appropriated by the capitalists by selling the commodities produced by workers on the market. So it's hidden. The workers get their wages, which appears to be fair, and the capitalists sell the product, which appears to be fair, but of course, the difference 
is produced, the surplus value is produced because the capitalist can sell in value terms those commodities at a higher value than they pay the workers. That's the fundamental uh, way in which capitalism uh, creates production and it also creates profit in the process of production. And it also provides, as we, as we would argue uh, in Marxist terms, uh, the fault line in the capitalist mode of production because profitability comes into conflict not only with social needs, but also with production itself through crises. But in the first chapter, we deal with uh, nature. I don't want to go too far into this because I'm sure you're well aware, but we're arguing here that uh, uh, nature, the natural uh, of the planet and everything is now being commodified and that uh, capitalism is spending its time through the rapacious expansion uh, uncontrolled into all parts of the planet, um, destruction of uh, natural resources and species with them in order to boost uh, uh, pr profitability and to appropriate the resources provided by nature. This is uncontrolled under capitalism. It's not part of a plan uh, by which uh, we can work in harmony with other species and, and the rest of the planet as, as human beings. It's done only in the interests of uh, boosting profit. And that has led, as we know, to a really serious development in the planet which threatens its existence. First, there is global warming, the increasing global temperatures on an average basis, well beyond the averages achieved before uh, industrialization, and the acceleration of that global temperature towards levels which have been called tipping points, where there's an irreversible uh, development in the planet, it can't be reversed, and that we will have from here on uh, extreme weather conditions, droughts, floods, wildfires, and other developments which threaten up to hundreds of millions, if not billions of people living in unbearable conditions around the planet. That's the future of the next 10 or 20 years, if not earlier, uh, as a result of global warming, which we know is the result now of the uncontrolled development of fossil fuel production uh, for the big oil companies and energy companies, and the failure of governments and, of course, the capitalist corporations to make any attempt to really effectively reduce uh, the level of uh, carbon emission production, which is creating this war. And that process continues, as we know, uh, there with little sign that there's any real serious uh, reduction in carbon emissions as we go into the rest of this decade and beyond. That's also not just a question of global warming, but the environmental disaster, which we see where species are being wiped out, where food and ocean conditions are being reduced dramatically, uh, where the infrastructure and the built environment is wiping out uh, species as well. And uh, of course, extractive mining industries and energy doing the same. So we now have probably something like a massive section of uh, species around the world and the general diversity of uh, uh, species being destroyed uh, by the process of capitalism. And that's an environmental disaster uh, that's not just affecting uh, climate, but also affecting the variability of uh, the planet to survive in the form of wider and diverse, uh, diverse species. Um, and then, we, of course, we've seen the development of pandemics, which we never had before at the level since the early 20th century. Uh, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, not the first one, but the most widespread, uh, is only a product of uh, the rapacious drive into remote parts of the world where dangerous pathogens inside wild animals have come into contact with uh, industrial farming, with others. Uh, farming animals and, of course, humanity itself. And so COVID-19 has led to uh, something like 20 million life years lost uh, compared to what would have been the case without it um, up until uh, the end of December 2020. And probably another 120 million additional years of people around the world now driven back into poverty because of the pandemic. Uh, and, of course, such pandemics can reappear. There's every possibility that we will see further ones. Um, 
despite the efforts of now of uh, science to provide vaccines and try to bring them in, there are many other viruses floating around. Unless there's controlled effort to uh, uh, stop uh, capital spreading to these areas and not providing the, the uh, necessary controls, there's every possibility that these uh, viruses will produce further pandemics down the road. In chapter two, as I say, we deal with the question of money in the 21st century, and we look at new forms of uh, new theories of money, uh, which argue that in uh, modern monetary theory, and they also looks at new forms of money, cryptocurrencies, the digital currencies that replace existing uh, national state currencies, uh, which uh, are decentralized, at least that's the word is, that they are in fact completely digital and they're not under the control of the state. And that this uh, is a new development. Uh, the cryptocurrency people uh, claim that this is a, a new positive development breaking from the state. But as I really argue in the book, cryptocurrencies are no such thing at all. And then the divergence between the development value creation and money supply growth is created in the recent period of inflation. And Marx argued that money necessarily comes out of the process of exchange, uh, and it's a necessary substitute for simple barter. That's obvious that we don't exchange loaves of bread for chairs. We use something which is universally accepted as uh, providing the basis for making that exchange, which we call money. We can- Sorry, audio has changed again, sorry. Right. Yeah, so this, this means that the money um, is, can be proper money. The most convenient form of money will be something you can store easily over time, which doesn't uh, degrade and which uh, can be used uh, fairly quickly in terms of exchange and in uh, the use of uh, <coughs> savings and so on. <coughs> and that has taken the form <coughs> of, me, of gold in the past, silver in the past, paper currencies, and now digital ones. Now, modern monetary theory is a new development in the 21st century, and the uh, supporters of modern, modern monetary theory argue that because money is now uh, such a digital basis, and because it's really totally under the control of the state or the government, it is perfectly possible to print money or create money digitally in the banks to use to spend by the government on all the resources that people need. And there is no need to worry about the uh, capital requiring you to uh, issue bonds, which they want interest on. You just uh, print the money and that money can then be spent by the government. It will produce productive assets, uh, things that people need, and it will therefore pay for itself. So modern monetary theory is arguing that don't worry about the social structure of capitalism as it is. We don't need to touch that. We just need to have control of the money supply uh, to use it in our interests uh, uh, for society as a whole, and that therefore we can in this way, uh, as it were, bypass or overcome the law of value and the process of capital and exchange and sales on the market. Uh, for modern monetary theory does not recognize any need to worry about profit or the social structure of the economy. I think this is uh, a theory which uh, I haven't got time to go into, which is really a throwback uh, to the 19th century uh, position of uh, Joseph Proudhon. Uh, Marx uh, criticized the view that all we need is uh, to have money and credit, and we don't need to do anything about the fact that the capital controls the means of production and exploits labor in the workplace. And I think this, we can show, and have shown in the book, how this theory just does not work. The other one is cryptocurrencies, as I say, we're saying that uh, cryptocurrency is a digital currency stored in a decentralized system, not under the control of the state. Uh, and it's argued that uh, this means that the labor or workers or individuals can now run their own uh, savings and currency and make their own exchanges without the domination of the state uh, currency. Of course, we have found out only over the last decade or so that that's not the case. It is really just a big speculative asset, like many others, where the price of, of the currency in, re in relation to cryptocurrencies, in relation to national uh, currencies, which people still use, 
is so volatile, it jumps all over the place from day to day, and it's not possible to be used in any such way as an alternative currency out of the control of the state. More than that, it seems that the uh, people who dominate the cryptocurrency markets are quite often crooks. Uh, uh, they control um, a size proportion of the funding in cryptocurrencies, which they've expropriated and embezzled. Uh, the latest case currently going through the US of such a major cryptocurrency uh, funder and market. So this is an illusion that cryptocurrencies can replace uh, existing state currencies and provide, as it were, freedom up uh, for uh, working people to break from the capitalist state. So in a similar way that, in a rather contradictory way, well, modern monetary theorists say that the state can print money because it controls it, and then it will be good for labor. The cryptocurrency people say the opposite. We can make money that's nothing to do with the state, and that gives us freedom uh, to create a better society. Neither of these particular theories, in my view, works. Um, that brings us to the question of inflation, which you've seen in the last two or three years in particular. Uh, in the book, we go in to discuss different theories of inflation. And what's the one most likely one, what's the clearest one that we can understand? We reckon it's related. Uh, the audio is going again. Yeah. I'm not sure what's happening. It's terrible. I'm sorry about this. So uh, we hope. How is that, Jasmine? Can you hear that? No? That's good, yeah, that's good. Okay, so we hope that, um, we, we argue that uh, inflation must be better related to what is happening with value creation and not the other theories of inflation that we've seen presented over the uh, previous decades and in this one. Just this quote here, you can see from the head of the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, who pointed out that at the moment, uh, mainstream economics doesn't really know what causes inflation. Uh, as he says, after the recent experience, we understand better now how little we understand about inflation. Uh, that honest statement, of course, is followed up by the usual argument presented by many of the authorities that what causes inflation is workers asking for too much wages. And the famous quote of the recent period from Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, saying that nobody gets a pay rise. I'm not saying they shouldn't get a pay rise, but I am saying we do need to see restraint in pay bargaining, otherwise it will get out of control. And perhaps the clearest mainstream statement here is when wages go up, that leaves prices to go up. So if airline um, staff and food ingredients go up in price, then airlines and restaurants will increase their prices. Similarly, if wages for flight attendants or servers go up, then they also raise their prices. This follows from basic common sense, says the leading mainstream. Well, it is not basic. It may be basic common sense. It may seem that, that if wages are increased, their prices will have to be increased. But that assumes, of course, that profits will stay as they are. And the reality is that it's not a question of wages increasing prices. Wages of chasing prices, usually, and that the issue here is also to leave out profits altogether. And in the book, we, dis we discuss uh, Karl Marx's reply to that very argument that John Weston, who was a member of the International Working Men's Association in 1865, a carpenter and trade unionist, argued that we cannot ask for more wages because the bosses will raise prices. So we went back where we started in real terms. And Marx goes into detail to say there are lots of factors involved uh, that are not just a question of wages that affect the prices. In the book, we go into a little bit more how we see uh, the value, a value theory of inflation, that inflation really depends on the relationship between money supply growth and the increase in new value as measured in hours of labor. And we find in our work that if we analyze the amount of hours increased per year, uh, or falling per year and the amount of money supply growth per year, and we measure the difference, we get a sort of value uh, rate of inflation. And if we apply that to the actual existing official inflation rate, we find a very high correlation. So that means 
we can expect or understand that um, modern inflation in consumer prices and in generally in the prices of goods uh, depends on the relationship between money supply growth and value creation. And that means that if productivity goes up, if value creation can be increased as well, uh, and, then there, and then you can expect inflation to be relatively low. But if uh, hours worked um, fall back or their money supply is sharply increased by central banks, then you expect inflation to rise. That's the basis of our theory, but we'll be going to it in more detail, obviously, than I can here. Chapter three, I'll go through this, but I think probably many people listening or watching this will know Marx's theory of crises, which depends on the nature and changes in profitability on a regular basis. And in particular, the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. And here is the measure of the world rate of profit uh, done by different uh, economists over the last few years. And you can see that it goes back until the middle of the... Well, actually, actually, to the date when Marx wrote Capital, or published Capital, in 1867, that there is a general tendency for the rate of profit on capital, on in a world scale, uh, to fall over time. Not in a straight line, because there are periods when the rate of profit rises again, and we, that's part of explaining why that is the case. But nevertheless, the downward pressure on the profitability of capital means that at regular and recurring intervals, there will be crises of investment, accumulation, production, and then employment of people's incomes and livelihoods. These can be restored by an increase in profitability as a result of those slumps, or through other measures like world wars, but eventually the pressure for downward falls in the rate of profit will apply again. This is the fundamental law of the tendency of rate of profit to fall, which lies as the ultimate cause of regular recurring crises. This graph shows recessions in the US in the previous periods, 1958, 74, 80, 1990, 2001, and of course the Great Recession of 2008-9. And what it shows is the dark black block shows the fall in the rate of profit uh, taking place just at the beginning or the, just before the slump uh, takes place, and also the fall in the mass of profit which follows. So when the rate of profit falls sufficiently, you actually reduce the total amount of profit. And that's what triggers a recession on most occasions, as this graph argues. In chapter four, we deal with modern imperialism, which is still with us after 100 years. In 1915, as we know, uh, Lenin wrote uh, a summary of what how he saw uh, the development of imperialism at the end of the 19th century, uh, called the last or highest stage of uh, capitalism, in which he pointed out through the export of capital internationally, a small group of multinational companies and banks based in a small group of countries in the Northern Hemisphere, dominate, beginning to dominate the world and also restrict the ability of other countries to escape their domination and to develop themselves. So uh, when we go back a hundred years later, we found when we analyzed the situation that the same uh, countries in that imperialist block that Lenin refers to in 1915 have hardly changed in the last 100 years. So if you like, those the imperialist block is composed of the G7 economies, the top seven capitalist economies, with the US being by far the most important, plus a few other smaller economies, if you like, Australia, some of the Scandinavian countries, obviously some of the smaller Eurozone countries within the Eurozone, on the western part of Europe, that constitutes the imperialist bloc. There are no other countries in the last hundred years who can claim to have joined that bloc. Not uh, Russia, not India, not China, not Brazil, not Indonesia, not any of the other uh, poorer countries of the world in the southern hemisphere. And there's a good reason for that, we argue, because what is happening is a massive transfer of value through international trade and through capital flows from the dominated countries uh, to the small group in the imperialist bloc. Uh, we focus in the book on this transfer of surplus value 
through the international process of trade. And we explain how that happens using uh, the law of value and Marxist theory. And you can see that here's a measure of the transfer of surplus value from the rest of the world, uh, the dominated block of the G20, to the imperialist block, which is a massive amount of billions per year being transferred through. This is just through trade. There are other ways that increase the, that transfer of value through capital flows and so on, which means that something like we estimate 3% of the world's GDP gets transferred every year. And that's a minimum. Uh, from the rest of the world to the dominated to the imperialist bloc. In the third, fifth chapter, which is really uh, right on the, uh, the topic again that we're seeing, capital creates not uh, appropriates not just value from uh, physical labour, what you might call uh, objective labour, things that uh, people produce physically and services they carry out, but also from mental labour. The knowledge that they create in their own brains and which are then applied in some form, either in the form of physical robots or in software or in other ways in which uh, can raise the productivity of, of labour. And Cabot can appropriate that product of mental labour just as it can appropriate it from physical or objective labour, as we've seen in the past. Increasingly, this is the, uh, the amount of knowledge appropriation by in terms of value it's modern form of appropriation of labor that we hadn't seen before in the 19th century or and certainly not even in the 20th century so not only have we seen the replacement of human labor by robots but also we're beginning to see the attempt to appropriate control knowledge change knowledge uh, through artificial intelligence uh, can this completely replace humanity in the 21st century? It's an open discussion that we can have. But first, let me show you that robots, there are more robots in the world than human beings now, or will be shortly. Uh, you'll be glad to hear that that's not a disaster for humanity because robots average life, which these are physical things, of course, only are only about 11 years, while human beings at the moment can talk about 70 years. But even so, Increasingly, robots are beginning to replace uh, uh, work done by human labor up to now, uh, and that's going to expand even more over the next few decades. And of course, we've seen the development now of artificial intelligence and learning machine programs, which uh, supposedly uh, are self-learning and therefore can uh, develop knowledge and expand knowledge uh, under the control of those who own those machines uh, to an unlimited amount that could even replace uh, human intelligence. In the book, we argue that's not the case. That this, uh, these learning machines will not be able to replace uh, human intelligence because human intelligence is not the same as machine learning. But we can discuss that uh, if we have time. Uh, the important point about human intelligence is it has the potential for change, in particular social change, uh, which... Uh, machine learning machines do not have. They're really a reproduction of existing imaginative ideas produced by human intelligence in the past. Then in the final chapter, we deal with socialism. What do we mean by socialism, we say in the book? Well, first of all, it means common ownership of all the means of production, the end of private property in terms of production in the mode of production. It means no money. It means we don't have any exchange process of commodities. Everything is uh, produced and delivered directly to be consumed. So in that sense, there is no law of value, no exchange, no money. In that sense, there's also a class of society because there will be no capitalists and there will be no workers because there will be no ownership of the means of production and those that can only sell their labor power. Everybody will be the same in that sense in relation to the, a mode of production. And there will be no state, there will be no need for a pressed, oppressive force of armed bodies of men uh, organized to maintain the property relations that exist and the control for the owners of the means of production. Instead, we move to the administration of all the things that we produce, the services that we require and the social needs, not a state machine to control the existing property relations. So when you look at those four points, you have to say that there is nowhere in the world which approaches anything like 
from achieving socialism if that's what is correct about the nature of socialism. <clears throat> even we have to consider how we even move towards such a process of uh, uh, society which we could call socialist. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels outline some of the things that we must start with if we even to begin the process towards communism. State control of finance and commerce, public ownership of the key means of production, progressive taxation, public works, levelling up of incomes, free education, health, communications, transport at the point of use, and gradually over that process well, through a planned economy and the removal of exchange in the market from sectors of economic production, money and prices gradually disappear. So that's the beginning of the process of socialism. It's not the end. That's the start. Uh, once that the uh, capitalist state and the repressive forces of the capitalist state have been removed and workers, democracy and control is there. This is the first condition of transition. Uh, so in the transition, we want to move from a planned economy. We don't want market socialism. We don't want the continuation of exchange and money in a social society. It must be a planned economy. That we move towards calculating and developing uh, production on the basis of that plan and using all the modern techniques of computers, software and so on to make that feasible. And that social needs now dominate over private consumption. So vast majority of what people get in needs actually comes socially. Uh, transport, communications, uh, health, education, food. Lots of things do not have to be provided by people going out personally to have to collect them, buy them, and they will be done by the state free at the point of use. So monetary exchange is gradually replaced by direct production. And it must be done internationally because if you think about it, there is no way that such a process can possibly be achieved while the imperialist bloc remains in position of control of the world's resources and labor power. And that means an international change, not just a national one. It may start nationally, but it cannot even begin to process the transition without it going international. Um, so that raises the question of what, whether we have any such socialist uh, societies at the moment. In my view, no. Uh, I don't think that the state socialism that we have with Chinese characteristics, if you like, it exists in China, but on the other hand, are these countries capitalist? Soviet Union, in, my, in the book, we argue is not capitalist, and China is not capitalist now, but neither is it its socialist. These are, it were economies in the case of the Soviet Union, and are, in the case of China, economies in transition. The question is whether they're transitioning towards a socialist. That question we discuss in the book, amongst all these others. So that is it, Yasmin. I apologies for the uh, sound. Um, I hope that we can proceed from there. No problem. Thanks very much for your report. So that's... Stop recording.